Good afternoon. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you better, Patrick. Okay, okay. Good afternoon to all. Once again, thanks to Sister Ricardo and family for that brief song service. Giving thanks to God. We pray that God's mercies will attend them. Good evening to everyone. We are welcome to another session. Uh, this evening is question time, question and answers. Uh, there are some people who say they are pretty clear on the principles that they can make applications in situations. And there are some still who say that they would want to ask a few questions. If they've gone over the studies uh, and that is cleared up, and they don't have the questions this afternoon, then we'll give Brother Newton as much time as possible. But that is the situation as it is, that there are still some who believe that. Of course, there, 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 there can be many more handouts on um, religious legislation, under laws, um, God and Caesar, um, the Christians, uh, response to civil authorities. There, 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 there are a lot of areas you can produce some more information, um, but it was simply an expansion of the information already given and also just uh, expansion of the principles already laid down. So I'm prepared this afternoon to listen to some questions. If I can answer, I will. If I can't, I'll simply tell you I can't. Um, but this is an area that is extremely important according to inspiration as we come to closing events. The people of God will face many tests and have many decisions to make. And whether it will be faith or presumption, it will judge movements and so on, will in fact play a part in how much suffering or extra suffering they go through or untimely suffering that they go through before they needed to. So at this time, let us pray and ask God's leading that we may in fact see what he saw, see, get what he seeks to teach us. Let us pray. O merciful God who art in heaven, this evening as we come to you, give us broken hearts. Give us repentant spirits. Give us that need, that awareness, that in fact, like the prodigal son, help us to come to ourselves and run to our father so that you may bound us up and bind us up and clothe us fully so that your glory will shine through us because of your abounding mercies. In fact, when you spoke to Moses, you said, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, that is who you are. You cannot act otherwise. And so be gracious and merciful to us this evening. Help us to understand that there's need for great repentance moment by moment, day by day. That there's need for the submission that brings victory and brings progress in the spiritual life. Help us to understand that there's need to buy a deed, buy indeed gold tried in the fire and white raiment and I sell. And so keep buying them so that we can always have by that tremendous submission and indwelling Christ in us. So we thank you for being merciful to us. We thank you for being our great savior and God. We, grant, we thank you for being our teacher. And so, as you've given us this wonderful Sabbath, may the blessings received thus far be those to lift us from above ourselves into heavenly places. Forgive and bless. Remember those who are suffering in any way. Deal with them in mercy, O Father. And so comfort our hearts. And in, in fact, clarify for us anything that still needs clarifying now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Um, the last time I spoke with you, um, at the end, there were a couple of questions, uh, and those persons can remind me of them if they want, but Sister Audrey had raised one too, and so on. So 
let me just briefly for five minutes or so or less, just um, say a few words. In this subject area, Brother Douglas has dealt with it extensively in his book camp book. He also dealt with it subsequently. And in addition, he has given me the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. And uh, we all move at different pace. So there were always people who would have been behind some and some who would have been advanced in understanding the subject matter. But the area that I try to concretize and, and um, give you some better understanding, or should I say a simpler understanding, we talked about the order of government and whether there was a divine objective. We talked about religious liberty quite a bit. Of course, there's much more on that, but Sister White talked a lot about religious liberty in the 1880s and 1890s and talked about it when the Sunday law was being posed there a lot and showed how it is something that the people of God must know and must understand so that they can meet the difficulties. So we looked at that, we looked at the relation of the state to the conscience of man and the attitude believers should have towards the civil authorities. And that came to fore too, because um, you know we're in a pandemic, whether it's ending now or cooling down, but we are in a pandemic. And in the early stages last year and a little before that, you had professed Christians with all kinds of views and that kind of thing, and whether protocols were inhibiting their religious freedoms and so on. All of that came into focus, uh, which is important for us to understand. Uh, we looked at civil administration in regard to religious liberty and whether um, our response should be faith and not presumption. We looked at Sunday laws and our intelligent faith response. Uh, we reviewed God and Caesar to show and, and the Sunday laws involved. And we also looked at the intent uh, of religious, religious, the intent, the spirit, and results of religious legislation, which is also a very important area. Uh, and so uh, this evening, then, I will open um, for questions during the time that I have, and um, we can discuss uh, any area. You might, there might still be some disagreement, and that is fine. Um, but let us go. Um, yeah, um, I'll just say at the beginning before you take any questions is that religious liberty, study it carefully, both from the Bible and inspiration, you'll see it dwells largely upon the right of the individual to worship God according his judgment, his own judgment, no, his own judgment, and according to the dictates of conscience and reason. Worship has to do with God as morality has to do with God. And, though, and since God has given freedom to all creatures, it must mean then that the creatures must be responsible to God for that freedom, especially that freedom in regard to religion. So religion is the duty that we owe to God and the manner of discharging that duty. And therefore, I want to say then that God respects that freedom. He also respects the choice that people make with that freedom. If they choose to use it in the right way, all right, if they choose it in the wrong way, God still respects it. However, he seeks to win you back to the right choice to come back to him that the results and rewards of the right choice will be reaped. Otherwise, the rewards of the wrong choice will be reaped and so on. So when we looked at um, the ordinance of government, we looked at Daniel 4, 11 and 12 to show what the true representation of a good government meeting the objectives of God and so on. So that is important. Um, there's a text that is used in a lot of contexts too, other contexts too, which, are, which is important, like John 12, 47, 48, 49, 47, 48, 49, which says, 
when Jesus said that he does not judge anybody who, who reject his word. Now, I suggest to you that that too, Jesus is speaking and saying, I have given you freedom and I respect that freedom. Whatever choice you make, I've given you the right choice, but you can choose from that and go from that. So he says, if you make the wrong choice, I will not judge you. So it is important then for us to understand these things. All right, so I open at this point in time. Um, well, let me one other point. Religious liberty is an inalienable right. That is, is a right given by God. Is not a right given by the state or really can be removed by the state. They may inhibit, to some extent, your physical movements, but in fact, the freedom that God has given is yours, however you use it. Okay, any questions? Uh, Brother Patrick? Yep. Just for order, um, I have a question or two, but just for order, uh, just for order, could we get persons who want to ask questions just to raise the hand. Um, yes, so they can you, do that and you, you can monitor that. I will down and monitor it, yes. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, so my, my first question is two questions. One has to do with religious liberty mm -hmm. and its definition. Yep. Is that related to have laws in a society? Can I claim that is my religious freedom not to follow the health laws that is instituted by the government in relation to certain, um, well, the, the thing that we have right now is the whole thing about uh, vaccinations. Yep. Can I claim the principle of religious liberty as my right to disobey that requirement? One, that's one question. The other question has to do with the Constitution presently in Barbados is going through what we would call a reform. Is it right for the church to identify aspects of the Constitution that they would like to see, especially in relation to religious liberty during the discussions in relation to Constitution reform? Those two questions, please. Well, thanks, you've asked some very difficult questions. Uh, but let us go at them. Would you say that the theocracy under God gives lessons in dealing with diseases and maybe pandemic? Would you say that? That say under that. the theocracy, under the theocracy, we have tremendous understanding, instruction, and insight as to how to deal with some of these things. I would say that. I would say that. Yeah. Now, in Israel, I think Brad Douglas mentioned it some months ago. In Israel, too, when a person had an infectious disease like leprosy, he was asked to stay away from the other people who were not sick. Was that God taking away his religious liberty? Would you say? I would say no, but I don't know what the others would say. <laughs> well, I'm just it, uh, having you since you right there talking to me. So it is not necessarily directed at you. If you want to disagree, you can disagree. Not a problem. But right there, if God instructed it, it must mean there was some wisdom in it. So reasoning logically, if God instructed something, it must have been with good reason. And the good reason was to stop the contamination of others. Therefore, I would think that God himself instituted have laws where when, certain, when people had certain things, they had to wash. If they touched certain things, they had to wash. Of course, there were no, um, of course, you can say that 
these prescriptions were sort of not injected vaccinations, but in fact, they acted that way to keep others from being infected and to help others along the way. All right. So what I'm saying is, is that God himself instituted a number of health laws. We have a health message and we are supposed to only do that which. Now, we believe that the Christians of past ages, especially the reformers that we know, had to live through pandemics. So this one is not the first. And as I mentioned some weeks ago, in the pandemic, the people of God, so long as it does not affect your religious liberty, that is, it does not affect your ability to worship God, unless you have some particular condition which doing that thing will in fact end your life or something like that. But other than that, other than that, we had people who've gone to prison but still serve God. We had people who went into the lion's den and worship God, prayed to God, who went into the fiery furnace and praised God. So that, so that although there may be alterations to your physical movement, in fact, unless it really begins to get in between you and God, between your relationship and communion with God, really and truly, is simply a matter of good judgment, good reason, and good common sense. And as inspiration mentioned, you should not put your life in there. And so common sense would tell you, and judgment and reason that God has given, based on all that is available to you, the information available to you, properly studied under God, with the help of those who can give clear explanations and so on, under God, you will be able to make a rational and good judgment decision which protects you and protects your neighbor. And note this, note this, people should be very careful. The two great commandments, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, of, and people don't understand that if you do anything that damages your neighbor, you're breaking that commandment. You must therefore, whatever you do, even in pandemics, it must be not only to protect yourself, but to protect those around you who would be your neighbors. I, when I say around you, those you come in contact with, whether they live just in your area or in other areas, um, they will be your neighbor according to scripture. And the, I, it is my view, you can disagree with this one, it's my view that that text is misunderstood. Maybe I have misunderstood it, but people that I've thought interpret that second commandment about loving your neighbor as yourself, say you got to love yourself first before you love your neighbor. I am not inclined to believe that's what the text is saying. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I won't go into that now. But the point I'm making is that if you do anything that damages or hurts your neighbor, it means that you are breaking the commandments of God and that cannot be really religious liberty or exercise of religious liberty. I hope if I need to add anything further, I'll do that. But the second question, answering questions demands that you understand them before you can give a rational and uh, a clear response. You are asking, when the civil government is making its, its changes to its constitutions or any important legislation which will affect citizens and so on, whether the church, you didn't say this, but I'm saying it, whether the church as a church or whether individuals of church should in fact be let their voices heard. Is that what you're asking? Yes, that's what I'm asking. Okay, I added in peace, but I figured that's what he was asking. Um, yes, there, there is room for when Eddie Jones went in 88, it was a situation where he went as a representative of the Seventh day Adventist Church. And there may be room for that. The, 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 the government of the day may stipulate yes, groups and churches can come. And therefore, then the church. If that, if that 
can be seen as a legitimate exercise is not infringing on the on the area of the state or anything like that, then the state, then the church can in fact partake in it. Also, individuals of the church can indeed make contributions, not necessarily as representatives of the church, but as citizens indeed having knowledge. Because even if a church sends representatives, there may be other people, even in that same congregation, who may have tremendous views on the matter. But let us say that the church sends representatives. Right now, I do not see that there is anything that forbids a church from sending representatives to make suggestions and, in fact, to make sure, to, 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 like what Jones did in some respect, if something comes up which infringes or seeks to infringe religious liberty, they can explain that they may not succeed. They may not succeed. The state may still do what it wants to do, but lending their voice and letting them see that that step is against religious liberty and in fact will lead to persecution of the religion that is not accepted by the state, then they need to let their voices be known. Individuals can do it. The church can also do it because the church in doing it or individuals in doing it actually will be bringing to the fore that which may be dangerous to the society or dangerous to the Christian religion or dangerous to people at large. And therefore, they have a right to make it. I think inspiration makes that point that sometimes we need in certain situations as we judge them under God to make our contributions known, which may in fact cause something that will damage people and society in fact, to be held back, to be kept back. And bear in mind that the Revelation 7 tells us that we ought to be praying now. The people who consider themselves the people of God must should be praying, asking God to hold back the four winds of strife that the truth may go to the world. I hope I've done justice to your question. If I have not, just let me know and I will see what else I can add. Right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yes, brother. Uh, Rain McLean is hands up. Okay. He has to speak slowly <laughs> so that he may understand. Okay, no brother. offense, Rain. <laughs> okay, brother Patrick. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Now, in your presentation, you had referenced um, the situation in Daniel with yep. the fact that the Hebrew boys were actually denouncing the Babylonian food, even on the basis of their religion. I, I just want a clear explanation of how you tie it to religion. And then my question would be, if it is so, well, even if it was not so, the basis on which they were declining the use of Babylonian food, one would consider it to be injurious to health. That would be my assumption for, for, for not wanting to have it. So yes, that's correct, that they were, right. it was injurious to health in the first place. Right. So very, so very, they, very rich. It was very rich food. <laughs> and rich so, there means rich there means having done in a way that was not promoting health. Well, it may be tasty, it was not promoting health. Go ahead. And I would assume also, since it was not promoting health, then it could also disrupt your ability to worship God in the truest sense. I, I would assume so. But well, on the basis yes, what, you, what you put into your body does have an effect on your thinking and so on. So on the basis of that, um, the conscience that they were protecting and also the health that they were protecting by declining the food. Would you say that by that declining of wanting to not eat of the Babylonian food was a right that can be defended on religious grounds? That's my question. 
<laughs> Interesting question. First of all, the Daniel and his friends, and there were more than three, but those three, those four stand out. Um, they were trained from small to take care of the body. And even in the test that was given after 10 days, God multiplied their health because of their faith and allegiance to him. Um, getting back to the, the food itself. The food was offered to Nebuchadnezzar's God. Actually, before it was eaten, there was a sort of, um, the correct word wouldn't come to me now, but there was a sort of uh, worship. This is not probably the best word, but there was a sort of worship to the idol God when you were about to consume the food. And inspiration makes it clear that had Daniel participated in that. Like a ritual? Yeah, ritual-like. Uh, there there's a different word I'm looking for, but ritual is all right, and so on. So inspiration tells us, and uh, I should have pulled it up to, to read it to you. Inspiration tells us that had they partaken of the food, one, it would have been injurious to their health, but they also would have given a bad witness and also they would have given the impression to others that they were in fact given obedience to the Mucodazer's God. So, and they perceive that. Obviously, they perceive that, that in eating the food, they were going beyond, based on the ritual, I'll use your word for now, the ritual that was involved and what Nebuchadnezzar and the others did when they were about to partake of the food and blessing it to the God and other things and so on. They saw that eating the food went further than just being bad food. It went further. It went to allegiance to their God. There would have been, I think that the word you use, they would have been showing allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar's idol god. And therefore, they took, it took great perception under the spirit of God for Daniel and his friends to see that is where it was and what it meant and not just a diet. But in fact, it would be to show based on the background circumstances and the information provided by inspiration, they would have been shown allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar's God. And they saw that. They saw beyond the food and therefore they rejected it. Now, the matter of food, does it in any way, and these are the questions we have to ask, does God require it? Now, if God requires it, then if God requires you not to do something, even if you are being punished by a civil authority, you should refrain from doing it. So if God says you should not eat pig, if it is offered to you, you will argue that according to your conscience, according to the word of God, according to your belief, you should not participate in that. And I think that is the reason you can argue. Am I clear enough or are you still, or I didn't get you clear enough? Yes, yes. So if that's on the basis of which you can argue, then let me be more direct now with a question in terms of where would the church stand on the position of, since we are in a pandemic, where would the church stand on the basis of a mandatory vaccination? Since there are some who consider it injurious to health, as it is now, since there is so much uncertainty about the vaccines, plural. So I'm just asking, um, would it be yeah. would it be right on the part of the church to not support mandatory vaccination, since there are those for liberty of conscience sake or for religious reasons, would suggest that it is harmful to the individual or individuals? 
Well, you're asking me to do a bit of speculation since it is not mandatory as yet. However, I'll take your second point and see what I can surmise with it. Now, vaccinations, you will have to argue if you say that the church, did you say the church should be against it or should be for it? By the way, are you hearing me? Yes, my finger just slipped there a moment. Yes, I'm saying, I'm asking if the church should support it. Since oh, so it should support, is, okay. Yes, since there is, since there is a liberty of conscience um, in the matter to be considered, as well as religious grounds to consider. Okay, okay. Um, religious liberty, in its clear definition, and inspiration gives, gives one, um, gives many, if you read the writings of Ellen White, gives many, is a duty we owe to God and the manner of discharging that duty. Is a vaccination a duty we owe to God and the manner of discharging that duty? What is your answer? What, do you, what would you say to that? Would you say a vaccination is a duty we owe to God and the manner of discharging it? Well, on the basis of we tying just now the liberty of conscience of the Hebrew boys, as well as to religion, and it being injurious to health, which would have offset their ability to worship God in the truest sense, then why can I not tie also considering something, even if it's not vaccination, that is injurious to my health, tying it also to my inability or um, lesser ability to worship God in the truest sense that I can. So therefore, if the vaccine poses a threat to my health, then would it not be safe considering it not just a deterrent to my freedom of conscience, but also a deterrent to my religious freedom. All right. Let, let, you can take a comment on that. If you want to, but I, I'm, I will respond also. Uh, just to read from Patriots and Prophets in regards to Daniel and, and the reason why he rejected the king's meat. Uh, Daniel so desired he might have found in his surroundings a possible excuse from departing from strictly temperate habits. He might have argued that dependent as he was on the king's favor and subject to his power, there was no other course for him to pursue than to eat of the king's food and drink of his wine. And drink of his wine, for should he adhere to the divine teaching, he would offend the king and probably lose his position and his life should he disregard the commandment of the Lord. So, Daniel was being asked to partake of the king table, and whatever was on that table would have, would have caused him to break a commandment of the Lord. I do not know of a commandment of the Lord in relation to vaccine. <laughs> because... We have been having vaccines from the time we were children. So brother, my, my brother would have to tell me if God has commanded humanity not to take vaccine. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Brother Peter. Uh, there is though another quote from uh, Inspiration, which deals especially with the, with the matter of um, allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar's God and so on. But the point you made, I'm familiar with, and that is also important. But the first point to you, Brother McLean, is that one, um, things that you eat which are injurious to your health has already been prohibited in scriptures. So you should now be using that for any reason that has been so throughout the ages that God has from the very beginning prohibited certain things, especially after the flood, uh, prohibited certain things from consumption. And that is you, we call it temperance, but it really re refers hol holistically to self-governance, self-government, self-governance. 
And that is what's needed even in a pandemic, self-governance, where people won't spread things and so on. Um, I was told of a family recently who the young guy was infected and he didn't tell the family nothing. And then the whole family was infected and the, the father almost died uh, at Harrison Point. He recovered and uh, uh, there's a reason why you recover too, but the, but the, the, but we have that. Secondly, I was making the point to you that vaccines, taking a vaccine or not taking a vaccine, does it interfere with your worship to God? No, we already have what the people call exemptions, where if it is known, or if you say you have a condition which can be worsened by the vaccine, you are not commanded or mandated or forced to take it. Is there, there's a question Brother Peter was asking in a different way, is there, oh boy, the point slipped me. Anyway, so let me go back and see if it will come back to mind. So we have exemptions. So can there be a religious ground on which you can argue that you should not take a vaccine because it interferes with your religious liberty. I keep repeating then, and maybe I'll share the quotation before I'm finished, before I'm finished, that religion is the duty we owe to God and the manner of discharging it. That has to do with your relationship to God, your worship. Does vaccination, now I know you're linking the diet, which, a bad diet, which may in fact um, blur your mental strength, like wine and rum and so on, may blur your mental uh, faculties and so on, but there is sufficient information, Brother Peter mentioned from small, you were having vaccines and so on, but Generally speaking, vaccines have not been proven to be bad. There have been cases, just like Sister White couldn't use, I think it was tomato, but there was nothing wrong with the tomato. Something was wrong with her system. So she couldn't use it, but her family and other people used it. So I'm saying to you that vaccines may cause some people a problem. But it is not a universal thing. And indeed, if it is something for the good of humanity, outside of the exemptions, and I do not know that truly you can argue that you, can, you don't want a vaccine on religious liberty grounds. You can argue you don't want it on medical grounds as far as I am aware. As far as I am aware. But I personally do not see where you can argue it in terms of religious liberty. That is, that it interferes with your duty of worship to God and the manner of discharging that duty, the way you want to discharge that duty. The, the vaccination does not affect the way you worship. It does not affect your relationship to God. It may affect your health if there's something wrong with your system and it reacts to it differently. But at present, at present, we all can get more information and we can get grow strong in the word of God and the light of God. But at present, my view is that one, there's no, in Barbados, there's no mandatory vaccination. Two, vaccination have been regarded for, cent for hundreds of years now, um, for a long time, sorry, that they do provide a benefit. And I don't have time to go through it, Brother Doug, I think went through it some time ago in terms of smallpox, this thing, the next thing, measles, everything, and so on. So that they do protect. I will agree with you that we have millions and billions of people and all of them will not be able to. Now, I think Brother Doug can open a can of tomato paste and eat all without any problem. I do that. They may have to call the ambulance for me. But I can eat six tomatoes one time. But I can't open a can and eat the tomato paste. Is something wrong with the tomato paste? That Dr. Douglas eats with relish. So certain things will react to our systems differently. He suffers migraine. I don't. 
So there are certain things will react to our systems differently, but that does not mean that they interfere with our religious liberty, with our duty to worship God and the manner, the way that we worship God. I hope I've helped. If you're Brother not satisfied. Patrick, can I can I make a quick point? Certainly. Comment on, on that. Yeah, I, I think you made an excellent point, and so did Brother Brother Peter. Um, I just, just want to add that we do have mandatory vaccines now. Most of the childhood oh, vaccines are mandatory. And you can also have exemptions on religious reasons. They're, they're, they're Rastafarians. They still submit letters to the Ministry of Health asking for exemptions from some of those childhood vaccines. And they're granted it on religious grounds. Um, you can have a doctor submit a, a letter on your behalf if they think that, you know, as you did mention on, on health grounds, if they think that it is an issue. But we, we have to understand that in public health, the premise is the betterment of the entire community. Correct. Individuals might have an issue, whether it's religious, whether they think you know, whatever reason, and they can have an exemption. But when you're looking at mass things, the public health right is to protect those in the public domain. So take, for instance, if um, the brother wants to be exempted, then he has the right to write and request the exemption if it is mandatory. But then when we look, as you mentioned, that individual that almost died, but we can look at individuals who would have died, you know. Um, we need to make sure that we protect people in our society, and that is what pu course. public health is all about. So you're making an excellent point. And when people come with the idea that it is bad and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that and bringing God into the picture, you have to be very careful when you're doing that. So that, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Just, just a, a minor clarification, Mr. Carita. I, well, I would my, more focus on this present vaccination and not the other va childhood vaccinations and so on that are mandatory, right? I wasn't focusing on that. But I, I, I know, but what, what I'm saying to you is when you. this one becomes mandatory, if or when it becomes mandatory, it will have the same premise. Agreed. You know, agreed. Be, because agreed. it would be a, a, a vaccine. So Precisely. therefore, you would be able to have your exemptions in the same vein that you had the exemptions previously. Right. But just just the point that I was making too about there are no religious exemptions. What I would what I would, I should have been clearer on that. What I mean is, yes, this, I know the civil governments in Antigua and other places, they give these religious exemptions. But as I discussed with some other elders and other people and so on, I'm saying I am not persuaded from scripture that you can really use religion to get an exemption. The state has given it, but I'm not sure that the word of God gives you any at all. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I, right? I, I, I agree with that. And the Seventh-day Adventist churches have never really you know, given exemptions. It is more the like Rastafarians and a few of the, the other churches, you know, that would have given to their people an exemption, but not right. the, the typical churches as such. Right. And, and, and it is there. So, so you can have these things because obviously even civil governments recognize that everybody in the same. <laughs> so, so that there will be cases that differ. But generally, as you said, and my view is, when God told a leper to stay away from society, it was public health. <laughs> it was to protect the society. So you really can't argue that at all. But it's an area that people have a lot of views, and I have no difficulty with them because gradually everybody must come to a point. Um, some of us are a little behind in certain things, and some of us are ahead in certain things, and we have to wait on one another, and we all will get a better understanding of these matters and be in union with one another. Thanks, Sister Caramito. Any other questions? Because we only have about five minutes before we go over to Brother Newton. I don't want to go over his time this afternoon at all. Yeah, I'm Adrian Carter with his hand up. 
Go ahead. Good evening. I'm here. Yeah, go ahead. I got three points. The purpose of the vaccine is that if you was to get sick, it's supposed to so long the process. The purpose of it. Number two, it all depends on your health. If your body is healthy and functioning right way, and your liver and your, and your kidneys, it will not it will not affect you. So it all depends on your body, the way how you eat, and, and that's all it needs. Now it's right, that, Yeah, go ahead. The vaccine is supposed to work along with cells in your body that, that if it works, it will not affect your body. You will still it will not lose your connection with God. You will still continue to worship Him and live your life. That's my point. So, so you're making the point that even in extreme cases, if a person is dying, it does not affect their ability to communicate with God. No, no. So a vaccine will affect your ability to communicate with God. No. All right. Thanks. Well, we all have to keep reading and keep studying. Thanks very much. Right. Okay. One last question, please. If not, we'll pray and hand over to Brother Newton. Well, thanks, Wayne. Thanks, Sister Caramita. Thanks, Brother Peter. Thanks for those who are listening. Um, I hope that our interaction this evening would have been a benefit to all. And uh, as we continue to rationally look at this matter, because I tell you this, the matter of religious liberty will be an important thing in the near distant future when the gospel, it will be in the character of God, everything, the true gospel, religious liberty will be part of that. It will have to be defended even although the world will move towards Sunday laws and religious legislation, it will have to be defended. And we have to know where God wants us to go, that we will not rashly make decisions and be presumptuous and place ourselves in danger or unnecessary danger and trouble before time. So thanks again. Um, for the Brett, 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 before you go. Yeah. Mm. Um, not a question to be entertained now, but... Will you say that the Nebuchadnezzar um, was using his health mandate to get a bigger issue resolved? And I asked that, or I, yes, I asked that because did you ever read anywhere where inspiration ties um, the law coming in? Ties, ties what? And the law, uh huh, with health issues, or they can use health issues as a, a reason or a door to promote um, anything about the law. You don't read about that. Well, there are some statements that, if you want to stretch them, other than that, you really can't stretch them. Um, but it is clear that she makes the point not in reference to um, using them as some reason against anything, but she makes the point that the mind and body and all of that has to be very, very uh, strong. Uh, the word I'm looking for now, I can't find it either, to in fact meet what is coming and be able to reason in a way that you are not trapped or tripped up and reason in a way that convinces people yeah. of the stand that you've taken. But it is something that, unfortunately, I can't discuss now, but oh, no, it's a good question, and um, uh -huh. I will look to pursue it with you another time. Thank you. And if, if I have to have another session with just questions, I'll do that, not a problem. Because it is not necessary for me to be able to rattle off answers, but to 
have the other minds of discussion in the matter that they can bring other perspectives and we look at them and earn them out anyway. So it's not a matter that, you know, that I will have to be answering every question. Sister Karami, remember that Peter came in, others will come in, you've come in with a question which is worth some consideration. So if we have to do another question session, we'll do that. Thanks so much. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for your mercies towards us. We thank you for the blessings of the day. We thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you've given us understanding and truth. May we hold to that truth. May we hold it by faith and hold it moment by moment so that, in fact, we shall be able to stand. We thank you for the blessings that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for the presence of your spirit. We thank you for those who've contributed, those who've listened. Be with us all now. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray.